Welcome in another sit down video. I am Jeff Nadeau. Uh, we are here live. Uh, please hit the like button and make sure you subscribe. We continue to get more and more subscribers. Very happy with my channel. Go check out all my latest videos. I've done some good ones on Teddy Persico, uh, Patty Catalano, all sorts of people. Uh, and make sure you go check them out. We have a great new show tomorrow. Paul Vario out on our podcast feed. Make sure you check that out. We get a great show planned for you tonight. We're going to talk to this man, Scott Berenstein. He is the author of the legendary mob book, Mafia Prince. And Scott, you're my guy. I talk to you all the time. You're doing your thing. And I feel like a bit of your protege. Would you say I'm your protege, <laughs> Scott? I, I'd be proud to claim you as my protege. <laughs> you will be my protege, I have to say. But you've killed it. The Gangster Report, the best uh, in, in crime right now. A lot going on. Uh, there's always stuff going on in the, the underworld, as they say, whether it's black gangsters, whether right. it's the mafia, whether it's the motorcycle clubs. You got that and more. Um, Which is why I, I kind of pride myself on my diversity. A lot of the people in this space just focus on La Cosa Nostra. And, I, and I'm, I would love to be able to only focus on... Uh, the Italian mafia, but you know, the fact of the matter is there's, you know, considering that I don't really do a lot of New York stuff, kind of do everything outside of New York. I mean, I dabble in New York, but I kind of leave New York to Capace and uh, Di Stefano and McShane and, and all those guys. But, you know, I, you need to be diverse to, to be able to put out consistent content. So I, I want to be just as much of an expert on black organized crime, Mexican organized crime, motorcycle organized crime than I am with the Italians. Well, I actually wanted to bring a story up you talked about. I actually didn't know this. And the good thing about Scott Bernstein is he always teaches you something you didn't know. Uh, if you're not growing, you're dying. And Scott is always adding to my growing brain uh, power and brain uh, volume. You put out a story, Scott, by the end of December about Rick Ross. I yeah. actually didn't know this. And I, I, I didn't know. Urge... Go ahead. I said, I didn't know it. You, you, you tease it. But I knew part of the story. Um, but I didn't know what we're going about to talk about until, you know, a day or two before I reported it. And I got some, um, court, uh, uh, testimony transcripts, you know, dropped in my lip. Yeah. So this is a really good article. And again, Scott Bernstein really does a great job with just keeping you up to date on what's going on. People that die, people, all sorts of different things. But so he put this story out about Rick Ross, who obviously is one of the biggest rappers in the game has been in the game for a lot of years i mean he's 100 millionaire at this point you put a story out that back in 2012 when he released blowing money fast which might be his biggest song ever maybe um in 2010 he put that out and if we remember in the song he says i think i'm big meech larry hoover now obviously he's referencing larry hoover gangster disciples founder and big meech now you reported that, and, and this was put out, I think, by another website, but you reported that once this happened, the Gangster Disciples approached Rick Ross about basically not getting the rights to talk about this, uh, and they shook him down. They wanted $6 million. They ended up getting $3 million and basically scared Rick Ross into paying. Yeah. I mean, these are allegations that have been made under oath. Uh, in, in federal uh, racketeering um, murder drug cases. So, I mean, I, I'll, I can say I reported it, and I guess me and a couple other outlets reported it, but we're really just reporting what was said in court transcripts. And for whatever reason, I don't know the motivation, particularly in December, but it looks like somebody uh, leaked out and circulated this testimony by this uh, turncoat gangster disciple named Markel White, who went by uh, Killer Kel, who uh, oversaw the, I believe, the Macon, Georgia um, gangster disciple crew. And uh, he testified at a trial, uh, I want to say last year, but now we're in 2022. So right. two years ago in 2020. And, uh, he testified to this under oath that uh, there was a, a, a altercation. I don't know if altercation is the right word. There was a meeting uh, that took place at the Lowe's Miami Beach Hotel off Collins Avenue. Um, I believe there's even a date on the meeting uh, in the fall of, oh, uh, 
I can rack my brain, but uh, twenty seventeen. Yeah. So I had reported about six months to a year ago about that meeting at the Lowe's hotel. So I was probably the first one to report on that. I never gave numbers. I didn't, you know, I, I got my hands on some DEA documents that spoke about this incident at the Lowe's hotel between a half dozen gangster disciple enforcers and, and Rick Ross that took place in the suite um, where it appears Rick Ross was scared for his life and, and, and cut a, either a check or gave up to $3 million in cash, $3 million in cash uh, to, to get these guys kind of off, uh, off his back. I mean, it's um, not a bad idea. I mean, so there was an allegation in one of those DA documents that Larry Hoover had a role in sending them to Rick Ross. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, what I do know is that there was a enforcement unit uh, across the Southern States. Gangster disciples are the, you know, probably the biggest street gang in America that aren't the Bloods or the Crips. Um, they probably have, maybe the Bloods might have more members because the Bloods are coast to coast when the Crips are really, well, I guess the Crips are coast to coast too. But anyway, the Gangster Disciples have about 30,000 members uh, right now, according to the federal government. Yeah, they're based in Chicago, but uh, founded in the late 60s. But uh, by the uh, 90s, they started to spread uh, outside of Illinois, and uh, they they have a a, a foothold uh, in a lot of uh, street gang activity uh, in Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and uh, they had a enforcement unit that was known as the Hate Committee. I'm not exactly sure wh wh where that name derived from, but uh, they were known as the Hate Committee. And it was like all the top enforcers um, across all the southern states uh, kind of made up this. It was like a, like a a muscle for hire unit within the, you know in house within the gangster disciples, and uh, these guys were were you know stone cold killers. Um, and this testimony took place. This killer Kel gave the testimony at the uh, the 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 leader of of the. Uh, of that hate committee, which was a guy named uh, Smurf, uh, Donnie Smurf Glass. So interesting story. I, I I never knew that. I know obviously Rick Ross has kind of dealt with some stuff around freeway Ricky Ross who sued him and he's had some kind of copyright problems. But this reminded me of a story I heard about from Steve Rifkin, who uh, was a record producer and everything. Yeah. And he talked about Raekwon talked about this recently on Vlad TV, the rapper Raekwon. He talked about when they did. Uh, only built for Cuban links, which ended up being one of his albums. They originally were going to call it Woo Gambinos. That was the name they were originally going to use. And Steve Rifkin's father, Jules Rifkin, got a phone call. From yeah, Gambino. I've heard this too. Yeah, yeah, and basically said, "Look, you're not using that name. Yeah. Uh, find another name." And they named. They ended up naming the song Woo Gambinos, but yeah, it, it didn't have Woo Gambinos in the front of the cover. Um, and look, if you know anything about a Puff Daddy, he's connected with Andrew Campos from the Gambino family. There's a lot of mob a lot connection. of crossover in yeah. the music, more so than any other industry in the music industry. Uh, and, and there was a lot back in the day, but in the move in mainstream music over the last 20, 30 years to where hip hop is no longer a, a genre or a subgenre, it's just pop music. And uh, with with the um, with that evolution, it it upticked the amount of uh, criminals on the um, outer edges and sometimes in the inner sanctum of, of certain music labels and uh, certain artists. I mean, I remember years ago, uh, Cassidy had "I'm a Hustler." Yeah, and in the video, uh, the Gotti brothers were in it. The the the, the ones from the show. Yeah. Uh, and they had a. Well, I heard. I heard some of their uh, relatives weren't thrilled about that. No, they had. I think one of them actually had a, a John uh, Senior shirt on. I, I yeah. believe. Uh, but well, yeah, one, definitely for crossovers. One thing I'll say. In my research. The the black criminals, the African American criminals, African American 
uh, rappers and hip hop artists, they, they have a lot of reverence for the OG Italian mafia. Oh yeah. Um, in my interviews with, with big Meech on the phone with him in prison, the black mafia family, uh, founder, he, he talks about his, I don't <laughs> heroes, uh, you know, in life being, you know, Meyer Lansky and, and lucky Luciano. Well, he's not no, talking about that. John Gotti and, you know, he's going all the way back. You know, he's you hear it. You really hear it everywhere. I mean, yeah. I, rem I remember hearing an, an ARAB interview uh, before he went away. And there was an individual that was running with ARAB, skinny me. He was uh, one of his subordinates. He ended up getting a murder charge on him, but he talked about in an interview. Um, they were running in the Arabs crew. They had a sub crew called murder Inc. And he talked yeah. about, in state prison, he heard about these Italian bulls he talked about, and they just, you know, named their gang Murder Inc. Like that, the, 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 the gangster ethos with the rap community has always been there. It's, um, it's, just, it's just interesting how it crosses racial boundaries. Oh, yeah. 100%. And how um, in other aspects of society, I don't think you have that type of reverence from an uh from an african-american culture or subculture with an italian 100 subculture no you definitely don't um so scott i want always wanted to ask you this um so you, you got into writing many years ago right you wrote mafia yeah, my first Brain. book came out in uh, late 06 so what was your first book by the way motor city mafia okay it was the a Detroit. regional regional book but it was a regional bestseller and um got me my con my first contract with a you know big publisher and was able to start publishing on major labels after that. So I, I don't want you to be like arrogant. You're not really that kind of guy. Would you think that Mafia Prince might be the best mob book ever? Like the work <laughs> like, it's not I'm just saying I, I'm very, very uh humble. I'm, well I'm all, I'm also very proud of it. It's in all my books it's the one that's kind of you know it's my signature it, it it kind of stamped my passport to be able to report and write about Philadelphia, even though I'm not from that area. Um, and it's just a story that's dear to my heart because it's what schooled me in the world of organized crime. I mean, I, I, I guess I, I have certain people, you know, say I have that encyclopedia, encyclopedia like knowledge of, of organized crime and, and uh, it, it, it's not something that a lot of people assume it's, you know, something I've been studying since I was a little kid. And it, it's not. It's something that I got into in my 20s when I was in law school and working um, in law school for the Illinois Attorney General's office. And I was working mafia cases when I was 23, 24. And that's what opened my eyes to this. And from working those uh in law school, uh, working some Chicago mob uh, activity, it was the uh, the first summer that I was doing that was the first. I'm oh, sorry, the first summer that I was doing that, which was the summer of '01, um, was the the big Philadelphia mob trial that was going on um, with the sure. Merlino crew, and uh, Ralph Natale was the star witness, and it was you know dominating the headlines in Philadelphia throughout that whole summer. And even though I wasn't in Philadelphia, because I was working in the AG's office, we would get these internal law enforcement memos. And I can remember being at a desk and this just kind of picking this piece of paper up. And it was talking about this trial that was about to start. And I that I think that afternoon or that day, I went down to the bookstore and bought Blood and Honor. And so... I was introduced to this world. I mean, a little bit from working those, those cases in Chicago when I was in law school, but I was such a, I was a guppy, you know, I was so young, green around the, uh, you know, green around the gills, but reading about Philadelphia inspired me to do this. So to be able to then write, you know, a seminal book in the, in the chronology or the chronicling of, of Philadelphia underworld activity or Philadelphia mob activity, just it, uh, it, yeah, just, it, it makes me, very proud and uh, something that I'm, uh, it was a labor of love. And I, I constantly want to just credit, you know, Phil, his guy, Chris Graziano and George Anastasia for, for making it possible. 
Do you, do you talk to Phil still? Uh, you know, I, I I can't say that we're buddy, you know, best buddies. Uh, I talk to him occasionally, just checking in, uh, maybe a couple times a year, uh, maybe if around uh, you know a royalty statement or something uh, from the book, or you know, we've had some television and film options that have been possibilities where we have to jump on the phone and talk business. But uh, I, I, the guy is, he's been really good to me. And um, he, I think I've, I might've said this on your show before, but uh, it's something that I, I like to trumpet when it comes to him. I've met, I want to say dozens of organized crime leaders across multiple spaces of organized crime. And uh, most of them, if you're meeting them and they're talking to you, most of the time, there's a reason you're meeting them and they're talking to you is because they're either they're no longer in a life voluntarily uh, because they they became a government informant or they've been shelved or for whatever. And, and I'm telling you, 99.9% .9 of these guys, if you offer them an opportunity that very second to go back to their, their mafia heyday, I mean, they wouldn't blink. They'd trade, everything. Him, right? They'd trade everything for it. And Phil has zero affinity for any of this or any of that. Uh, he, he, the anecdote that he gives that I like to relay is, you know, in the movie Goodfellas at the very end, he says, I'm just a regular schnook. And, and Ray Liotta's Henry Hill character is saying that as a negative. Um, I'm a nobody. And Phil says, exactly, I'm a nobody, and I, lo and I love being a nobody. That's what he likes. Yeah. Right. Let me ask you, um, I feel like I've asked you this before, but I want to ask you it again. And I feel like, I think I remember talking to you about this when we did the Nikki Scarf episode. That was like the second episode I did. I think it was with you. And uh, I asked you this question, and you said it was a good question, and I, I want to kind of talk about it again. And I've always said this. When we look back at Bruno, obviously we have, you know, Phil Testa. Obviously, you know, Salvi Testa was a name around here that was magic, right? Everybody loved him, young guy. Golden boy, the golden yeah, boy. Right, golden boy. Looked good, you know, dressed well, was liked by everybody, had the good bloodlines with his father. Why didn't Phil Testa's son, Salvi, and uh, Leonetti partner together and get rid of Nikki? I think it was a timing thing. Um I think the, the Salvi Testa situation, the decision to put a murder contract on his head and go after him was a huge turning point for everybody in that family. And it, I, I think you can chop up the Scarfo era to before Salvi's murder and after Salvi's murder. Um, and things were already careening off the rails uh, by that point, but uh, that murder really wheels were off the bus at that point. And uh, it, again, I, I don't think at the time that that was going on, I don't know if that was an option. I think if it had been a year later, um, I, I believe Phil, when he tells me that if they had not been indicted in the spring of 87, uh, Scarfa wouldn't have made it through the summer that he had intended to rally the troops himself and, and murder Scarfo uh, and kind of veil it from the commission in New York um, and then reassemble. Uh, Phil claims that he would have at that point left. That's neither here nor there, whether or not that's true. But uh, I think Nikki in 84, when that was happening, and around the spring of 84 was when he decided he wanted to kill Salvi. Um, he hadn't lost any support from New York at that point. If you, if, if you moved into 85, 86, 87, his support from New York started to fray. So when, I just think logistically in 84, in the spring of 84, I don't know if you could have pulled that off. I don't I don't necessarily think even if Phil would have been on board in theory in 84, 
I don't know if he would have gone gone through with it in practice. Like, even if Salvi would have reached out to him in the summer of 84 and been like, your uncle is crazy. He wants to kill me. If he kills me, he's going to kill you next. Let's join forces. Phil might have been like, what you're saying I don't disagree with, but I can't throw my lot in with you. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess it's it's something to think about, you know, long term and what it could have been, what the family could have been. Uh, because, again, Nikki Scarfer, really, after Phil Testa was killed, uh, the family was a complete mess um, from then on, quite honestly. The decision um, to kill Salvi Testa was so misguided. And, and I can't overemphasize what uh, what that did for the morale in that family, what that did, you know, in terms of the, 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 the trust factor in that family. And and Salvi was not a threat at all in any way, shape, or form. Anybody you talked to that was in the know at that time, Nikki was completely and utterly paranoid. There was no basis in reality of his belief that Salvi was somehow a threat to him, or Salvi was gonna um, was being subversive, or or would want to wrestle control of the family away from him. Salvi looked at him as a father. Salvi would have died for Nikki. Uh, put his life on the line for Nikki. So it just, in a, and a lot of it can, you know, it sounds, it sounds so ludicrous to say this, but a lot of it can be traced back to an article that was run. I think it was in the um, New York times or Washington post that, uh, that named uh, Salvi, the Prince of the city and right. the future yeah. of organized crime in Philadelphia. And it wasn't an article that like, it's not like Salvi Tessa had a PR firm running around being like, oh, you should write a story about Salvi being the prince of the city. And that article sent N N Nikki, uh, Nikki was incensed by the article and, and somehow thinking that just because people were heaping praise on Salvi, that that somehow diminished, yeah. diminished yeah. his power or diminished his, his influence. Uh, Mob Fireside Chat's checking in a great uh, site on her own. She has some. Have you ever heard of the book uh, before Bruno? By yeah, Celeste, Morello? Celeste uh, Morello. So Joe Ida, Sabella, yeah. they were all before uh, him. Yeah. Have you ever Have you ever seen that? Yeah, I've read it. I can't. I can't claim to be an expert on Philadelphia uh, pre uh, 1980. I mean, I know. I think I know more than the average person would know about Philadelphia from prohibition uh, into the seventies, but I would never call myself an expert. Um, I definitely know that Joe Ida was the boss uh, before Bruno. He's the guy that made Nicky Scarfo. Um, he retired and, and I, did he, did he move to, did he, did he go to, to, to Europe? Well, remember, also you had Joe Rugnetta, remember? Right. Know, Who was the consigliere for, for Bruno until uh, until he died in, in 72? Yeah, I mean, Joe, I think Sabella retired around the end of Prohibition, like around like the 30s, super long ago. And then, Ida then there was a huge power play yeah. uh, when Bruno took over. Uh, Pol Antonio Polina tried to... Uh, politic uh, into the boss's seat and and tried to have Bruno murdered and then Bruno got wind of it and I think this actually is what you know we're talking about where, where uh, narratives or, or, or uh, mythology stems from uh, I think that the the Dossel Don moniker which if you talk to a lot of people it's it's really not true there's parts of it that are true, but I don't think it's 100 percent true. But that that whole docile Don reputation uh, links back to the to Mi the Mr. Miggs uh, Antonio Polina, who Bruno decided he had every right to to kill this guy, and he decided to to, to spare his life um, and just put him on the shelf. And then Phil uh, Leonetti tells a, a funny story about uh, I think it was 84, 85 ish. And uh, someone died, and they had to fill the consigliere. Oh yeah, it was when Frank Mo Frank uh, Frank Monty was killed in the um, the war with uh, Riccobini, mm -hmm. and they needed to fill the consigliere spot. 
And I guess Polina, who was like a like an 85, 90 year old dude at that point, pops his head out of like been in retirement on the shelf for like 30 years, somehow arranges a meeting with Nikki Scarfo and Leonetti and like makes a play or a campaigns to be named the consigliere. And and Phil's like, we just laughed him out of the social club. Like, get out of here. Like, that's a great job. I mean, I guess he'd be a decent, like, kind of surveyor, I guess. But he's so old by that point. Well, at that point. Well, and then Nikki, you know, there was this. Um, Didn't Nikki Buck Pickle or take Yeah. So I was to say, Nikki just gave it to his uh, his cousin. Yeah, right. And if you know anything about Nikki connected to the Piccolo brothers. Yeah. Let me ask you, Scott. I want to switch gears a little bit to the Colombo crime family who – we know, obviously, had that big indictment come down uh, late last year. It was it September? You know, kind of almost late last year. Yeah. I might have come on here right after that, and I was like, what are we doing? The top three defendants in that case are all in their 80s. Right, but we look at the – so we look at the Colombo crime family. We look at the state of the mafia currently, right? And the Colombo crime family are fascinating. You know, you have so many names over the years. I've said before, I think they could be the most dangerous family. They had just – complete lunatics running yeah. around from Scarpa to Sonny Franzese to Charlie Panarella, uh, just tons of guys. Um, but I got some good news uh, after, off the air. I'll tell you, I got some good uh, news on the Scarpa project. Oh, good. Yeah. And that's something that we know you're working. We got on. Yeah, We got a green light in the cast. I, I can't announce it publicly, but uh, I'll tell you off record. Sounds good. Uh, so obviously the, the, the ruling body, Mush Russo, Castellazzo, Ralph Di Matteo, uh, Teddy Persco Jr. Pretty much everyone in the ruling body of the family is locked up at this point or on some sort of monitoring. The question is, the only people that are still around that I guess could be a, a successor would have been Persico Jr., who is locked up and not going to get out for a while. I don't, think he's ever getting, I don't think he's ever getting out. He's in there for the Wild Bill murder. Uh, Teddy Persco? Oh, you mean Teddy. I was talking yeah. about Alley yeah. Boy. Yeah, no, I'm talking about Teddy Persco. Who, skinny, he, te skinny Teddy. He's going to. Yeah, he got 12 years for that uh, Scopo hit and then obviously got jammed up right as he came out. He actually got out, but then he got jammed right back up. Yeah. But Joe Waverly's around still. Obviously. I think him and Joe Waverly are the yeah, guys that the, are the, 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 being you know, called. The, the, yeah, the next in up. line. Is this the end for this family? I mean, honestly, I mean. There's a lot of, there's a lot of Russos. Uh, True. Both Mush's, Billy Russo, I know. Both Mush's kids. Yeah, B I, Bill, Billy, Billy's his son, I believe. Um, I think it's the end of the Persico dynasty. Um, the mob is always gonna the mob as today going forward, going back the last 10, 15, 20 years. I mean, it's just it's a shadow of what it used to be. It will never be what it once was. But I don't think it will ever die out completely. Um, I think a lot of the regional families will die out. They've already a lot of them have already died out. Uh, I think you'll have a point in time where you have the five families: Chicago, Philadelphia, New Jersey. I mean, even in Detroit here, I, I don't know. I mean, we Detroit probably has another twenty years left. Uh, Hold on, I'm gonna I'm gonna move real quick. You got it. Scott told me before the show he might have to move, so we'll uh, we'll mute him for a second when he comes back, and uh, we can uh, we'll bring him right back. But yeah, so it's really that that's the big question going forward. You know, what's the the future of? Look, some of the other families are obviously well old machines. When you look at the Genovese's, the Gambino crime family, I mean, even some of the the other ones. But the Colombo crime family is a complete and utter mess at this point. And you know, look, as I said, it's really a question of who's who's in the leadership here. You know, Joe Waverly's around still. I mean, you have people like Sally Boy Castagno who's still around. He was uh, the guy that took over Benji Castellazzo's crew. But all these guys are going away, and they're all old, right? I mean, Bush Russo's in his late eighties. Uh, and one of the reasons for uh, his uh, home monitoring and getting bail was the fact that he was so old. So, yeah. And and the Wall Street Journal put out that great piece about how they talked about this and, and wiretaps, how they don't know if th these guys personally talked about how they don't know if the mob's going to be around because of the texting on phones and and people like, you know, Peter Tuccio, for God's sakes, that are around that are that are just talking about stuff over phones and 
these guys didn't grow up the same the Instagram way. Instagram mafia, man. That's the yeah. 21st century. It's amazing. It, you never thought you'd see the day. And it, there's an interesting uh, correlation in this story. I don't know if you heard about this. So Ralph DiMatteo, when he heard about this, hightailed it to Florida. Yeah. He goes down there with his son and his wife. They're down at the hotel pool. What's the son do? Takes out his phone and puts a picture of the father and puts it on Instagram. Yeah. And the feds immediately can tell where the fucking guy is. No, there's like, just, I want to make two comments about what we're talking about. First, if you believe the the wiretaps and you know the tape don't lie, just like my old basketball coach used to say, yeah. just football coach, you know, the tape doesn't lie. Well, your great friend George Anastasia says you, you can't cross examine the tapes. Right, you can't cross examine a, a, a wiretap. Um, if you if you if you peel or, or if you do a look over those uh, wiretaps that were released as part of the indictment. Andy Mush Russo uh, is senile. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of chatter in, in those wiretaps of his of his guys saying, you know, you tell this guy one thing on Monday, he doesn't remember it on Tuesday. Yeah, he's got major dementia from what I Yeah. Heard. So, I mean, because he was 87, 88 years old. Um, so that's, that's one thing. And, and again, that speaks to where we are uh, right now, um, that Mush Russo – was hanging on so tight that uh, he didn't feel comfortable, you know, at 87, 88, given the, given the family over. I mean, he, we, he's like, we talked, he's got a couple kids. What's the uh, issue. And this is something I've talked about with Carmen and Persico. What is the issue with some of these older guys in this family giving up control? Persico did it forever. I mean, they're, he's micromanag obsessed. they're micromanagers, man. Yeah, they really are. I mean, then, it's crazy. Let me just make one more point about Di Matteo, and and this this is going to go to all of these Twitter tough guys, um, and I'm not talking to the the the, the contingent of ex mobster Twitter tough guys. I'm talking about You're talking about the mob tube people. I'm talking about the. And I'm not. No, I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about oh, the okay. guys that are you know, living in Utah or Idaho and or they Nebraska, shit, yeah. and they research the mob, and they think. Because uh, a document they found in 1983 says something that it applies in, in 2021. They have no realistic application of what they're learning. So Di Matteo is a perfect example of nobody knew who Ralph Di Matteo was. That name was not a name that was ever associated, A, with being a made member of the mob. And beyond that, being a member of the administration. So it just shows it's an inexact science. You know, the, the numbers that people like to throw. Well, the FBI said in 2004 that the family only had 25 made members left. And it's like, okay, but it's been 20, it's been, it's been 18 years since then. We're just going to assume that there's been no making ceremony since then. So guys like Ralph DiMatteo fly under the radar. And the next thing you know, he gets indicted and he's the number three guy in the whole family. And nobody's ever heard of him. Yeah, when it comes to the Colombo family, particularly with this leadership, I mean, obviously you know who Mush Russo was, but like I didn't know much about Benji Castellazzo. I didn't know much about him. You mentioned Di Matteo, didn't know much about him. Well, what um, I'm saying is Castellazzo had been on the radar. Like you could Google him. Sure. Yeah. And yeah. Stuff. There's nothing. There's nothing that comes up when you Google Ralph Di Matteo outside of the bus he just took. Well, the only thing I knew about the like the, the family really at this point is you know Joe Waverly, you know Teddy Persico, but I knew I knew Fat Dennis DeLucia because. He got on the radar like 10 years ago when he accepted publicly that his daughter was a lesbian mm -hmm. and he put his support out for it. And there was a big thing about it because he's a mobster and he's like, OK, with this. And it was kind of new world type of, of stuff. But, uh, yeah, it, it's it's interesting that this is kind of where the mob is. And we've seen videos and Black Camper Mob is in the chat. He did a video on the, the mob today and how people like John A. like can walk around Little Italy and you know right. that's in the seventies or eighties. What right. happens? You know, Johnny wouldn't last twenty four hours. Wouldn't last twenty four hours. Yeah, uh, and, and that's kind of the, the state of where we are. Well, um, they just, it, and this is this is how they're going to survive, and they figured this out. You know, bodies just stop dropping. Yeah, and not they're to not say to, that yeah. murders aren't going to occur, but you know, it's last. It's, it used to, in some families used to be last resort. Now it's last, last, last resort. Yeah. 
I mean, and you, you just you, and you don't murder people, and, you, and you, there's less of a reason for the federal government to make you a priority. The that's why they're going after terrorists over the last twenty years because there's way more of a an interest in in uh, you know the safety of American citizens going after those guys than going after eighty year old mob shot callers. You who, look at the last who haven't years. Been ordered a murder or murdered anyone since the sixties. Right. And you look at the last 10 years, the only mob murders we've had were, I mean, Frank Cali wasn't a mob murder. Right. You had the Zatola hit, which, I mean, that was the son who was yep. just a lunatic who killed his own father. Uh, you know, maybe one or two others. You had the, the, the Purple Gang stuff. But outside of that, there there, no. there hasn't been anything. In New York, There's pro in the last 20 years in New York, there's been less than 10 mob murders. I would probably say a half dozen. Um and in 20 years, and if the previous 20 years, there had been 300, 400. Yeah, it was happening all the time. Yeah. And it's happened in every family. In Chicago, too. They were killing people in Chicago on a regular basis into the 2000s. And then, uh, you know, since um, since uh, the year 2000 in Chicago, uh, there's only been two or three uh, mob murders. In Detroit, who's always been a lesser violent a violent family. There's two or three in the last 20 years. Couple Philadelphia, Philadelphia. There was a bunch uh, in the early 2000s, and then uh, there's only been one, and we're not even sure if that really was a murder in 12 with DiPietro. Right. You have Long John. Uh, you have Long, you have Long John. Well, Emily. if you go into if you go into 99, you had Turchi and Marconi. Uh, Gino Marconi, Ronnie Turchi, Long John Monterano, Johnny Gongs, um, Man Dominic Maniscalco, I think in uh, in not 10, in 2010. 10. Louis Tura. Yeah. Um, Maniscalco was significantly after. He, I, I lived in South Philly at the time. I, I lived like four blocks away from where that happened, 17th and Wolf. And all that stuff is, they're, they're all unsolved. They've right. Never, never and, then, and if you want to go back in 97, you got the Dutchie Avacoli. Mm -hmm. uh, where he disappeared, nobody's ever no nobody's ever found him, uh, and I know, I I know that they're actively looking for him over the last couple of years. I mean that well, they stopped looking for him for a period of time, and then for whatever reason, new information they've gotten since seventeen or eighteen, two thousand seventeen, two thousand eighteen. They're they're I think have actually quietly dug up some property in New Jersey over the last couple of years, looking for him. Um, but, you know, uh, with the Marconi hit in 99, you know, the, 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 the allegation, and it's been written about, so I don't have a problem saying this, uh, the allegation is that that Marconi hit in April of 99 uh, was, was a contract that was given to the Boston guys or the New England guys, and that they came into Philly uh, and, and, and carried that out on behalf of uh, the, the Philly uh, administration. And, uh, you know, the guy that was the capo of that crew, um, Bobby Luisi, who I actually have, a, you know, very positive things to say about uh, in terms of my interactions with Bobby. But, you know, Bobby turned for a period of time, then recanted his testimony uh, and served, served his prison sentence and is now – out and he's in this mob to mob tube sphere but i'll tell you that uh he was the head of the boston crew the boston crew is is believed to have carried out that marconi hit i would guess if luisi would have cooperated all the way it would have been bad that that marconi hit would have come back and, and bit some of the guys that are running the family now let me ask you okay i just want a yes or no answer and then we'll move on we don't have to go deep into this mm -hmm. do you ever think we'll know a result to any of those hits no well no. i i, I want to say not in the, and then no time in the near future yeah neither do i maybe uh, in 30 years from now when yeah. someone dies and some fbi file gets leaked or whatever but i don't think you'll ever see them uh brought up in front of a jury there's there's been so much rumor and innuendo and scuttlebutt over the years about these old cold case murders and i'm not saying that the feds are not 
going a hundred miles an hour to try to make those cases, but <laughs> if they haven't made them yet, I don't see them making them anytime in no. the near future. Now, the last thing I'll say about it is I do believe there will be another racketeering case in addition to what we're seeing right now with that uh, drug racketeering case that, that some guys are fighting. I do think there will be another racketeering case coming down the pike in the next three or two, three years um, that powers that be in Philly will have to deal with. I don't think it will. I, I'm doubting they will include murders in that. But if you're guys that are, if you're, if you're between 60 and 65 and you get a racketeering conviction and you're a second or third time loser, that's that. It might sentence. not be a life sentence, but it's a 20 year sentence and you're 65 years old. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. A uh, couple comments here. Uh, when does Anthony Nicodema get out? Uh, Another 20, 20 years. 2040, probably. I mean, yeah, he got exactly. 50 years. Yeah. Uh, and this, the thing for Nicodemo that was bad and rough is, remember, Nicodemo had a state sentence. So he's out at yeah. SCI Phoenix, which is like 20 minutes from Philadelphia. Ain't many wise guys at SCI Phoenix. Yeah. Um, at least if he's in the feds, he could he could hang around with the, the Italian cars. But there's no... Well, but I bet, in Phoenix, it's I bet I bet though that he, he likes it for the fact that it keeps his family. I mean, he can see his wife yeah. and his kid. And Phoenix uh, is really it's brand new, so it's it's nice and it's state of the art. I mean, it's prison, but it's you know you know he'll like, he'll come out at some point. And in terms of the mafia, um, even if he's in his seventies, um, he'll be in good shape. And same, honestly, with Dom Grandy. Uh, who's, who's facing charges right now, reputed capo, reputed heir apparent. Um, you know, he's never done any time. I'm hearing he's going to – he might cop a plea and uh, take like an eight, ten-year sentence. But yeah, six. I, even if it's ten years and you do eight, so you come out when you're 50 years old and you come out and you're the boss. <laughs> yeah. Or whatever of whatever is left. Uh, left. Shine box. It's a the life is a secrecy now. No more social clubs, offshore accounts, wearing suit. Yeah, no. Look, uh, you got to go underground. That's kind of where they are now. Let me ask you something. Scott. And you got to go into the boy, and you got to go. You have to go underground, and then you have to go uh, up into the uh, corporate boardrooms, right? And get into the get it get in on the white collar stuff, right? Which is in that. If you go back to that case we were talking about earlier, the the Colombo case. Some of them were doing that, the the training schools and, yeah. and things like that. Um, someone asked about Nicky Scarfo Jr. Uh, he's got a lot. I mean, still got like I think another 12, 15, 17 years, something like that. Well, he's not in good standing anywhere. He's not in good standing with his own family. Which funny, I've said before, uh, my my best friends at Farrington and says he sees him all the time and he walks around like he's you know, you know this and that. So uh, I guess he he thinks you know. He doesn't. Well, I think he'll he'll pass. always get a somewhat of a free pass because Vic is still alive. Yeah. Um. Even though Vic Amuso sanctioned his demotion from being a capo, um, I don't think he shelved him per se. I think he just uh, demoted him, and um, I'm sure Nicky Scarfo Jr. thinks as long as. Amuso's there. He he has, I guess, a smidge of standing left that he can still leverage. Uh, I don't know how much respect he really has on the street. It, it surprises me, just like with the Columbos, how Vic Amuso micromanages that family from behind bars for the last 30, 30 He's 30 still years. listed as the official boss. Right. And he and if, you know, Cape, uh, Jerry Capace in, in New York has detailed some of these um, – uh, bloodless coups uh, or a bloodless coup. I, I don't even know if you call it a coup because he was the boss, but he, he swept out uh, one administration that he had put in place uh, by force, told them they had to step down or he would kill them um, and then replace them with the guys that are in power now. And the guys yeah, that he swept out were Stevie Wonder and, um, and Manny Madonna. Even yeah, though if you remember at one point, a big Frank Lastorino tried a coup of his own to, Get, get control of that family. It's it, it's a mess. And and you know again. So Amuso, just for people that don't know, Amuso supported uh, Nikki Scarfo Senior. Um, was really the only um, well the Genovese. I guess the Genovese and uh, 
and um, the Lucchese's were the only families that were backing Scarfo at the very, very end when he was still trying to hold on to the family. And uh, the, there was actually some reporting in the last year from the, from John Panisi, um, the, the Lucchese turncoat, who who talked about some of that power shift and how um, when Joey Merlino took over, Amuso was telling all the the the, the five the fat the dons of the five families that to not recognize him, to not to not recognize Merlino, and uh, according to Panisi, Barney Belomo sent word to the street saying disregard what Amuso saying. I'm recognizing Joey. Yeah, uh, Panisi has an interesting channel. Let me ask you a question uh, before we go. Uh, I put this on Twitter and posed this question: Greg Scarpa Jr. Didn't cooperate, went to prison, goes to prison, is at MDC, gets Ramsey Youssef to start talking. He tells him stuff, the terrorist. He cooperates against Youssef and yeah. Terry Nichols, I believe. Do you consider him a rat? Is that a rat? Is he a rat? So this is a, this is a debate that's popped up in Detroit over the Helped last Helped the year. country, didn't he? Well, but in Detroit specifically because of um, this uh, soldier named Paul Corrado who was brought down in the in the big big uh 96 bus that took down the whole family all the guys that killed uh, jimmy hoffa were brought mm -hmm. down in that bus and uh paulie carrado was was low man on the totem pole uh in terms of guys in that bus and he ended up doing 12 years um when when bosses and, and capos were doing five six seven years the reason i'm bringing this up is when he came out of prison in like 2011 or 12, there was a lot of talk about him and uh, how he was going to be received. And the reason that conversation uh, was taking place was because while he was uh, under indictment, uh, he was approached by a um, person that claiming that he could fix his jury, uh, a, a, an African-American criminal. And, uh, Paulie thought it was a he thought it was some type of sting, like the feds were sending this guy at him. Uh, and but Paulie wired up on this. Someone had nothing to do with the Italian mafia and had nothing to do with you know the inner workings of the Italian mafia, but he was claiming that he had an end to the jury. Right. Um, and I think Paulie thought that would help his sentencing when it didn't. He ended up getting the most the harshest sentence out of anybody. So he's coming out in 2011, 12. He's just done 12 years. In my mind, he should have been embraced. Like, hey, Jack Tokel, the Godfather, did two years. Tony's really the underboss. Did five. Billy Jackaloni, who some people think pulled the trigger in the Jimmy Hoffa case, did did six or seven. Paulie does 12, but he walked out and he was shunned because of the the debate that we're having right now. And I remember, and, I, and and one of the most intimate mafia conversations I've ever been allowed to listen in on was in the months before he came out of prison. I got to hear, a, and I, don't ask me why they had this conversation in front of me, but I got to hear a conversation between the Detroit Mafia consigliere and, a, and an acting capo. Um, they had this conversation with me at the table about uh, whether or not Paul... Corrado, when he comes out of prison, should be given a promotion or should he be put on the shelf? And one guy was arguing, you know, he didn't testify against us. He didn't cooperate against us. He was trying to help his case. It had no, it had nothing to do with any of the Italians. It had nothing to do with our crime family. Um, so it doesn't count as cooperation. And then the other guy was like, hey, man, I'm old school. If you wire up for the federal government, you're a cooperator. I don't care who you're cooperating against. Right. It's so, fascinating. Yeah. I mean, so for me, you know, with, with, with Scarpa Jr., I mean, I don't I don't blame him, especially who he was wiring up on, you know, terrorist. Um, right. I think he has more more uh, an, a, more of an argument to be made that that's excusable than than Polly Corrado. But I still don't blame Polly Corrado for doing that. But 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 where we're sitting here now, 2020, he's not. Uh, you know, he's not at a uh, at a soup kitchen or anything, but, you know, Paul Corrado is 
in my opinion, you know, this guy took a bullet for everybody. Mm-hmm. He was a he was a collector. He was he got a, 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 a pinch when he was 32, 33 years old. And bosses do two, three years, four years. He has to do 12. And then he comes out and he's shunned. I, 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 didn't, Crazy. Really, I, didn't, I didn't really have a. Yeah, it's interesting to think about. Yeah. Uh, one other thing. Did former FBI agent Lynn Navecchio abuse his relationship with Gregory's girlfriend? Yeah. Yeah. He should be in jail for sure. Of course. Yeah. I, Lynn Navecchio got away with murder. Literally. Yes. Um, and. Uh, He's in Florida now. And just, it's the same I mean, thing as John Conley. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. Pretty much. Um, the only difference is I think Conley was, well, actually, no, they were both operating in the same amount of time. Uh, and Conley got a long sentence and Linda Vecchio got, he got acquitted. Yeah. He got, he beat the rap. So yeah. Scott, what do you have going on right now? Let us know. And, uh, where we can so, uh, I got, uh, a, a big project at stars right now for, with black mafia family, uh, worked on the first season of the BMF show. Uh, for 50 Cent and, and, and the Stars Network. We have a, a docuseries that's going to be coming out in a couple weeks um, that will be the real story behind the, the fictional or semi-fictional uh, scripted uh, show that was a, a smash hit back in the fall. Um, so I'm really excited about that. You're going to see every major BMF uh, lieutenant uh, that's still alive is is participating in it. Uh, Big Meech is participating in it from prison. Um, all the FBI agents, all the DEA agents, and then what's really cool is you're going to be able to hear from Fifty, Nelly, Fabulous, uh, Jermaine Dupri, uh, LL Cool J. Um, they're all they're all participating in and in, uh, interviewing for this. So it's it's going to be a kind of a pop culture extravaganza. Um, kind of diving back into the BMF stuff. So I'm excited about that. And then uh, I'm working with the History Channel on a Hoffa uh, <laughs> story that will never die. Um, it's evergreen for, uh, for for people like myself. Um, I've worked on, a, <laughs> I feel like I've worked on a thousand Hoffa projects in 15 years. Yeah, you um, definitely have. Yeah, so I'm working on, uh, it's a uh, a part of the, I want to say long running, but I might be misspeaking. It's called his. It's called History's Greatest Mysteries with Lawrence Fishburne, yeah. um, and uh, I participated in a episode uh, that they did last year, and was a consultant for them. And then they, I guess, had had such a good response from that article, combined with uh, this upcoming search that will probably be taking place in New Jersey come the spring. So the History Channel is doing a whole 90 minute uh, History's Greatest Mysteries special that I'm going to be. Um, hey, Scott, what are the odds that Jimmy Hoffa is there? Uh, Give me betting odds. 10 to 1 against? Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I I've, don't talked to Eric, I've talked to Eric Sean from Fox News. He, he Yeah, well, he, here, here's what here's. Exciting. <laughs> this, this is my uh, bold prediction here. I think it's very possible that they dig up a body, but the body's not Hoffa's. Right. Or they, oh, yeah. I should say a body. They dig up remains. Hmm. Um, and I think, you know, the, the most brilliant aspect of the Detroit Mafia pulling off the Hoffa murder conspiracy um, was this massive disinformation campaign that they put out in the years after, specifically the Jackaloni brothers. Um who really seem to get a get their jollies from kind of tweaking people and 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 telling people false narratives uh, about the Hoffa case, um, and because they were probably the ones that did it, uh, the people that they were hearing or the, the people that were hearing stories from them were, were saying, "Well, I'm getting it from the horse's mouth," when in fact Billy and Tony and I believe Jack Toko, who was the boss at that time just made a decision that they were going to uh, muddy the waters as much as possible and just tell a lot of lies to people that were of, 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 of a position that would be possibly in, entitled to know. So I think that Brother Moscato and Paul Capo, uh, Capola, who were the guys that owned that trash dump, that they're the, the former site 
Oh, that now is the former site of that trash dump, which currently is a uh, state park and nature preserve in in uh, in Jersey City, New Jersey. I I don't think they were lying. I think they were told by Tony Provenzano um, that Hoffa was coming down to Jersey to be buried. I believe the Jackalones were lying. If this is if this is what happened, and there is something there to be found. That the Jackalones told Tony Provenzano, "Yeah, we're sending you off." Of. And in reality, they sent him some other. Some they didn't other send him, right? That's um, so, and I, I think it was the same thing with Tony Zerilli, who was really the best tip they ever got was the, the Zerilli tip in back in 2013, where you had the underboss of the family telling you uh, where where they took him. But the fact that the underboss was lied to as a part of this disinformation campaign, just shows you how, how high up the chain that it went. If anybody should have known, Tony Zarelli should have known. He was in prison at the time it happened, so he wasn't there when it happened. But when he came out of prison, he had every right to say what happened because he had been at the forefront of pushing off into power in the first place. And they, they, they met him and they said, okay, we're going to tell you exactly what happened. And they... They lied to him. They said we put him up in Jack's property up in uh, Oakland Township, and so Tony Z back in thirteen thought he had some huge trump card, some big ace up his sleeve, and he was going to get the twenty five million dollar reward and ride off into the sunset. But the joke was on him. They dug there and they didn't find it. Fascinating. Yeah, I guess we're going to see another another tale in the Hoffa uh, mystery. Yeah. A couple of things before we go. Shinebox, thank you. Very nice and good chemistry. Thank you, bro. That's very kind of you. Uh, there's also a, uh, this is a fascinating comment, Scott. Uh, Kabani Savage is in the chat. It says, Ayo, young bull, take that video down about me. Quote, you the police. <laughs> well, listen, talking? Kabani's at ADX. I, Kabani, I don't know how you're getting a phone in ADX. Pretty hard. He's probably talking about something that Prophet put up uh, on Gangster Report. Uh, um, no, he's talking about me. I have a video. Oh, yeah, you, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, we are not the police. Uh, but hey, Kabani, let me know if you want to come on the show sometime. Maybe we can get you on. I, lo I love that. I love the, uh, uh, that. Um, I don't know if critique is the right word, but when I hear people from like the street or whatever, who are like, uh, you're a snitch or you're, you're, the, a, you're the FBI. I'm like, what? I'm a reporter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a job to report. I'm not. And believe me, if I'm reporting it, it ain't a it ain't a secret to the federal government. <laughs> Here's the thing, Scott. There's a different. There's two types of people that do content. Okay, people that get paid for it, they're just hobbies for those people. And there are people that do get paid for it. You get paid for it. I have a podcast. I, in a way, get paid for it. So, again, believe you know, me, the podcast don't pay me. <laughs> well, you make money off something. Like yeah, the, you know, whatever you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jeff, you and Scott Burns need to do this again or make it a regular thing. Yeah, Scott's a great guy. He's my my goomba, uh, kumbare here. Uh, so we're happy to have I'm hopefully, him. I'm going to hopefully be out there uh, by Jeff's way. Uh, oh, really? By the uh, end of the winter. I, I got uh, my my little cousins in college at Temple. I got some other business I got to do out there. So we'll, well, we'll, we'll be able to meet up in person. We will have a great meal. I know that. Uh, we'll definitely link up. Scott's a great guy. My Scott, cousin's a, my little cousin's a freshman at Temple. He loves it. Yeah, my sister went to Temple. Couple of my family members. It's a great place. Very multicultural. It's a great place. Yeah. Um, gets a bad rap. It's a great, great school. Great place. Uh, check out Scott. Um, Gangsterreport.com. Bernsey's tweets on Twitter. Bernie's uh, tweets. B u r n e y s t w e t t s. Uh, Original Gangsters podcast. Wherever podcasts are yep. consumed. I've been um, on that. It's a great show. And then uh, I got six books that are available wherever books are purchased. And uh, I have uh, a project. Hopefully I'll be able to come on and announce in the near future um, that I can say that there's going to be a, a project um, about Greg Scarpa um, that I'm that I'm working on with some pretty big names. And uh, it's hopefully we're going to have an announcement soon about who's who's going to be playing him and when we're going to be shooting and where you can find it uh, in, in 2023. I will tell you right now. Okay. Go check out the original gangsters podcast by Scott Bernstein and uh, Jimmy. They do a great show. And Scott has told me about this Scarpa project and who's working on it, it as the potential to be really fucking good. So 
Uh, keep that in mind. Greg Scarpa. I actually have made a comment, uh, Scott, real quick. I think Greg Scarpa, when we look at the most interesting people in the history of the mob, Greg Scarpa might be at the top. He's in the top. He's in the top. He's definitely into that into that pantheon. I mean, fascinating this, uh, individual. This For people that don't know, in addition to being a, a mafia killer and and big time earner and uh, this uh, historical figure from Brooklyn, um, he was also a, a CIA asset. Yes. You know, That's cool. People just want to. He was an FBI snitch. Well, oh, yeah, he was, but it was more. It, it was more than that. He was doing black ops. Yeah, uh, the CIA was like sending them to like foreign countries to do hits and shit. Let me ask you, are you, real quick, are you consulting with the family at all on that project or no? With the Scarpa family? Well, um, no, Linda. Uh, I have a reason for this question. L Linda's a little uh, antagonistic um, regarding some of this. The mother uh, or the daughter? The both. Okay. Little Linda and Big Linda. Well, I was going to um, ask her a date with Little Linda. I've tried to contact her, but it, did, I, it hasn't been successful. I we have fun on this channel because I've mentioned before I like Little Linda, but people, well, we, we we did we, we had a couple conversations with them um, early on, and uh, they they have some other deals set up, but it's been sitting in limbo for quite okay. a while, and I don't think it's ever really going to get off the ground. And it's from their perspective. Um, this is all from Greg's perspective. Linda obviously is a a, a, a pivotal character in in the story. Um, they write her. I've read I've read some of the scripts. Uh, her character's written great, um, but uh, yeah, I don't think she's going to be involved. Uh, and then Larry uh, Larry Meza was initially uh, on board as a consultant. Um, he now has his own project going on, and. Uh, Sammy the Bull has something uh, is involved in a consultancy capacity here. I'm not exactly sure what Sammy can, can shed light on about a Scarpa, but uh, the, the he has to that, be involved. He's involved. The in people everything. that were uh, that are behind this, uh, and and I, and and I'm not saying they're wrong because they know Hollywood way more than I know Hollywood. I've only well, been Scott. In this, let me know. Well, from five to two, they think that having uh, Sammy on uh, gives some type of credibility. Well, let me know if you need me for anything, Scott. Yes. I'm, I'm offering my services. Uh, real quick, uh, Culture C says the Jimmy Brown video is excellent. Thank you, Culture C. I did a video on Jimmy Brown. Great, uh, great person to talk about. Scott, thanks for talking. Good to see you. Uh, we'll talk to you real soon. Thanks, Jeff. All right, Scott. Uh, Scott Bernstein joining the show. Uh, my man and uh, my boy. Hopefully uh, you enjoyed that. You can check Scott out. Uh, wherever uh, you get a podcast, go check him out, the Original Gangsters podcast, uh, and check him out on Twitter at Burnsy's Tweets, B U R N E Y S T W E E T S. Uh, all right, guys, I'm out of here. Uh, go check out my videos. Uh, very happy with the performance of those videos uh, recently. Uh, we have a brand new episode of our podcast out tomorrow, the Sit Down A Mafia History podcast. You can check it out wherever you get your podcast, Paul Vario, Paul Vario, Paul Vario. It's going to be a great show. Uh, thank you, Anthony Sessa. You're very kind. Uh, how old is Linda Sr.? Uh, I don't know, in her 70s, but she still looks good. Um, thank you, Culture C. Take it easy. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. Shinebox, thank you for the super chat. You're very kind. Uh, I'm out of here. Catch you all later.